Okay, people, uh, I'm Lisa Lippincott, and I'm here to talk about practical interfaces for practical functions. And today, since I gave a lecture yesterday, which I hope all of you attended, I'm going to skip my usual introductory stuff and jump right in to a question that a surprising number of people ask me, which is this. Why C++? Now, I'm sure from time to time, the rest of you have been asked this question, but probably you don't get asked this question very often at a C++ conference like this one, whereas I do. <laughs> And I think the reason I get asked this question is because what they are really asking me is why I study the logic of C++. And they have this idea that there must be other languages where logic is easier to study. But C++ has a great advantage. C++ is a demonstrably practical language which many programmers have reasoned about at large scale for many purposes over a long period with great success. There's a huge amount of huge C++ programs running. So clearly, a lot of reasoning is going into C++. And in fact, I think it's safe to say that the vast majority of reasoning about programming is about programs that are either in C++ or in some language that is very similar to some subset of C++. So I think if you're going to study fish, you shouldn't ignore the ocean. And C++ is the ocean. Um, so Today, I'm going to take advantage of that because what I'm going to do is look at some demonstrably practical functions that people have been using successfully for a long time and write formal interfaces for them. And in doing, but I don't want to pick the nice examples, the cleanest examples. I'm going to pick the things that are old and maybe not so nice. And if you're looking for examples that are old and maybe not so nice, everybody knows worse things happen in C. <laughs> so I'm going to pick examples that were designed for use from C. And there is probably no more prominent example, you know, function designed for use than C than this one. Uh, let's talk about the interface for main. If we draw out what happens in the, what we use in the interface for main, we have two parameters, argv and argc. Argv is an array of pointers. Argc tells us how long the array of pointers is. Um, the pointers point to these null terminated byte strings. Um, I want to make a distinction, which I'm showing by color here, between two parts of the input to main. The actual input, the thing that actually gets passed as a parameter, as parameters is argc and argv. But actually, argc and argv themselves have nothing to do with the job of main. What the job of main is, is determined by the things that are green here. That's the job. argv and argc are incidental to the job. They help us find the job. They help us get to the parts of the job. They're the scaffolding that lets us do the job. But the job itself is a dot out, hello, and world. And the null characters, not part of the job. They're just helping us find where the scaffolding ends. Um, I, will show, I will point out that even the bytes of, the, of these, even these green bytes, have a tiny portion carved out 
that is part of the scaffolding, not part of the job. Um, by my information theoretic calculations, each byte is 99.54% job and 0.46% scaffolding. Um, and so the job is actually well mixed with the scaffolding here, which is tricky, but we can deal with it. Um, perhaps not recommended for designing new interfaces. So distinction between job and scaffolding is an important one today. Let's get back to our interface for main, which I'm going to lay out in a big blank interface here. Um, the implementation statement separates it into a prologue and an epilogue. The prologue happens before the implementation, the epilogue afterward. Um, and what we need to do in the prologue is explain what the input for main is. And we can do that by making a couple nested loops. We're going to loop over argc and loop over the characters of each string and say that the bytes of the string, except for the null character in this case, um, are usable. That is, they are the values of those things, of those const things in this case, are direct input to main. And so here is, if you saw the other talk, the direct input includes all the branches we're taking. They're part of the direct input. So the branches of the outer loop, which do incidentally tell us the value of argc and the branches of the inner loops, which incidentally tell us what the string length is, um, but also the directly claimed uh, values of star p. So that's our direct input here. And you'll notice that it kind of matches some of the scaffolding. The, the, these, these branches are parts of the direct input that also match parts of the scaffolding. They tell us the values. They tell us where the null characters are. Um, but that's just, you know, the reason they match is that when you do a job, it's a good idea to have the shape of the scaffolding match the shape of the job. Otherwise, it can be hard to get to the job or there's parts of the scaffolding that you never use. So that's why there's this close match in the branches. They are both shape of the scaffolding and shape of the job. Um, we can get some of this stuff out from underfoot by using a function. I'm going to use claimable functions to let us move assertions out of the scope of our interface, but still treat them as directly claimed. So here, require means the in, inside of a claimable function means that whatever function claimed this claimable thing is directly claiming the required bit here. So we haven't changed what the direct input is. We've just taken a common pattern and made a function out of it. And that helps us be a little abstract. We're going to be seeing a lot of usable NTBS today because C. Um, okay, that's really, that's the input. Um, we can look at the output. And the output I'm going to do a little trick for too, because our rule is if you repeat the direct input, you repeat the direct output. And here, the integer we return, we don't want to guarantee repetition of. We want to be able to call main with the same arguments and sometimes get a different integer out because it's really an error code. Um, so I'm going to use this trick of putting a claim inside of a claim, which makes this an indirect claim of usability. It's not direct output. So with that, um, we're almost done except it's important to conserve our capabilities. Our caller gave us access to the characters of these strings, to 
argc and argv themselves uh, to those pointers. Uh, and we need to show our caller that we are giving up that access. We have to pass the access back to our caller. And we can do that with another loop, pretty much saying the same thing. Those are still usable and alternated byte strings. Um, and that would be great, except argc and argv aren't const. We want to pass the same objects back to our caller, not different one, you know, maybe somebody zeroed out argc and we forget to pass back the other bytes. That's not great. So, simple solution. We'll just put const everywhere, and then we're good. Except, ah, uh, the strings in argv are not const. It's a long story. <laughs> the long story is there's a Unix utility called ps. ps tells you all the processes that are running on your computer, regardless of user. Um, it identifies those processes by giving you the name of the program, or if you ask it with a special argument, every argument of the command line of that program. That part, not so bad. But um, if you write a program that takes a password on the command line, PS will happily broadcast your password to every user of the system, and we think that's a bad thing. So a mechanism was, uh, was invented. A program can edit the strings passed to, pass to main in order to cause PS to show different command line arguments than were actually given to the process. And if the program does that, PS will broadcast your password to all the users of the system for a somewhat smaller period of time. In case I'm not clear, don't do this. <laughs> don't write programs that take passwords on the command line. Um, this mechanism does not work well. But we're stuck with it because C. Because um, Unix. Unix. Um, Question? Yes? I don't think we're going to get any in a better place. I just wanted to ask you, you had the nested usable. I, I didn't understand how that caused it to allow variation for different runs of the program. This was on the previous slide. Ah, well, I'm let's... Sorry, I just, I just didn't quite catch that. I thought it was important. Ah, uh, let's... Ah, uh, um... Yeah, yeah. could you just Oop, say that? Am I there? Uh, this one, right? Yes. So you're talking about claim, claim usable and claim usable here? Yes, you said that you want so, to different ones have different... Hey, yes, stats. so even if... So the rule is, if the direct input is repeated, the direct output is repeated. I'm using a trick here to make the result not contain direct output. Direct output would have been if I said require usable here, but here it's a claim inside of a claim. A claim inside of a claim is indirect. Okay. It's just a trick. Okay, so what are we going to do about this? Well, if you run into trouble, make a tool. Here's our tool. We're just going to suck up all the spans of the arguments into a single data structure using this function. It's pretty straightforward. I don't think anybody needs much time to read it. Um, using that function, um, we can just suck them all up they're usable on the way, it's usable on the way in, it's usable on the way out. I don't care, we're done. Um, and that pretty much gives us, yes? So from the mathematical model you're working from, how does making it a span fix the, change the fact that you can still modify the underlying RV? Ah, it, so uh, you can go ahead and modify it, but the spans, are const here in the, and they're in the interface. Variables that you declare in the interface are not accessible from the implementation. They are just for the interface. 
the implementation accesses the parameters, but any, lo any variables that are local to the interface are not accessible by, from the implementation. Um, okay, did I get your question? Fair enough. <laughs> um, you can ask afterwards if you want. Um, so with this, we actually have a fairly neat looking interface because we like took the complex thing and shoved it off into a tool. Once we have a, an interface that we are reasonably satisfied with, we can imagine what we would do if we had it to write over again. Like, how would we invent a new interface for main that was just nicer than this. Hmm? I just have to ask this question based on the previous question with the calling the function. I'm assuming that the function, because we have auto, we don't know exactly what it is this thing is returning. I know we saw it earlier, but I didn't see it. So I'm assuming that this is by value in some sense and not by reference? Uh, yeah, it's just returning a vector of spans. OK. Um, and we can, well, we can look at um, this interface um, and design a new interface for main if we had the opportunity to. This is a very simple interface. Usable, you know, usable parameters in, usable parameters out. It just does the thing you need. Um, I've also gotten rid of that return code. We're going to be C++ and throw an exception if things go wrong. Um, so if we had it to do all over again, this is a thing I would suggest. Um, any questions about main before we move on? Yes. Just why, why can't string view? I mean, string view can modify the can't modify that. So, modify so what? Well, yeah, this keeps you from modifying what the spans are, which is really whack oh, oh, a I wacky see. thing to do. Um, Span and string view have this sort of part reference, part pointer semantics to them, which I'm not really down with myself. I prefer to have classes that are definitely reference-like or definitely pointer-like. means you have to have more of them. Um, so I don't really like that aspect of span, but span everybody knows, so I can use it in a talk. Yes? Why do you have to do claim usable in Apple? You do claim usable in the epilogue to hand the resources back to the caller. But it's a local variable. I mean, it's local to the function. Arguments well, is not the, local to the function here. Yeah, okay. um, and all the strings inside, not local to the function. Uh, anything else? Yes. Uh, no, I used a span instead of a vector here because span. a span makes a better parameter type than a vector, I think. Um, but again, it had that pointer versus, um, you know, I, I did the const so because I don't want to reseat that span. Um, uh, well, let's move on to something that's actually hard. <laughs> Let's talk scanf. <laughs> uh, so here, scanf takes in a format string. Um, this time, you know, const all over the place. That part's nice. But we have this fancy dot, dot, dot. And that's not the template dot, dot, dot. That's the old dot, dot, dot. Um, that um, is there because, I, for those of you who haven't, um, dealt with scanf in the past, the format string tells us what the rest of the parameters are, like this. Um, format string, so format points to a null terminated byte string, that much we're, we're already familiar with, but this null terminated byte string has scanf directives in it. Scanf directives start with percent, they run until the right special character is run into, um, and each one effectively names not just an operation, but the type that that operation is going to produce from as, it, as an input operation, 
and whether or not that, it, that particular directive corresponds to a parameter in the dot, dot, dot section. I shouldn't say parameter. There are no parameters. There's only arguments. Um, usually those match up. Not here. <laughs> um, so each one of the directives that refers to, a, to an argument refers to a pointer which points to some amount of writable memory aligned for the appropriate type which comes from the directive. <sighs> so let's write an interface for it. Here's our interface block to start with. And I'll take care of the easy part first. Usable NTBS in, usable NTBS out. That much is pretty easy. Those, per, those arguments, I think I'm probably going to say parameters, but I should say arguments in the dot, 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 um, are accessed by some macros. Um, Vollist is a macro, perhaps, that gives us a type. Va start and va end are macros that are a little more wacky than that. Um, about all we know about va list is that it sets us up for, uh, is that it holds the stuff for iterating over the unnamed arguments. Um, and we can take a pointer to it. I was really glad for this that we can take a pointer to it. Um, va start and va end. Um, bracket an iteration over those uh, over the dot 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 arguments, um, and it's important to match them up. If you do va start without va end or va end without va start, then you have undefined behavior. And even more important to match them up, on some implementations, va start has a open curly brace and va end has a close curly brace that form a block within there. Um, so they have to be syntactically matched up, too. Um, and, of course, since we can't have a va start with, without a va end, it's important that we don't exit with an exception from that narrow gap in between. So I'm going to fill the narrow gap in between with a no accept function. But fortunately, I can use the same no accept function coming and going. This, isn't, this is reasonably common that your post conditions have a lot in common with your preconditions. Um, and here, the result of Scanf, one of the more obscure facts about Scanf, the result tells you how many of the arguments were written to. That's important because if you passed uninitialized variables to Scanf, it's going to initialize some portion of them and not the rest. If you're lucky, it actually succeeds and initializes all of them, and that's why pretty much everybody ignores the result. But formally, the result tells you how many of the arguments got written to. Ah, so we are going to use that to just let what usable scanf args varies, vary depending on whether we're in the written to or not written to ones. And of course, on the way in, none of them have been written to yet. <sighs> Ready? Let's go. Usable scanf args is our no accept function, and I'm making it no accept by using the strategy pattern. Strategy number one is to parse the format string and assert the appropriate things. Strategy number two is just fail. So now we, uh, this is a no accept way to um, test things that lets us use exceptions further down. Particularly, we can use exceptions to break out of the parsing. Uh, now we need usable args for scan of format. And usable args for scan of format is just a loop. Um, I, you know, if you make a fancy range class that iterates over the directives, and that's not all that hard to make. I think anybody here could make a range class that iterates over the directives with a little trouble, um, and put a test in in there to 
tell which ones have a parameter. And for each one that has a parameter, we will um, require usable arg for scanf directives for that parameter with a Boolean that tells us whether it's been written to or not. Not very hard. It's work. This is complicated, but it's just the sort of thing that's going to happen inside scanf anyway. If you were writing scanf, you already built this stuff. OK, usable arg for scanf directive, branch on, or do a switch, on the type code from the parameter, from the directive. Uh, there's actually a proposal in the works for a, I believe it's four dot 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 um, syntax that lets us expand uh, a whole lot of, um, expand a body repeatedly um, um, into a sequence of things template-wise. I think we need a sort of switch dot 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 for this pattern, because I see this coming up a lot, where all the cases in the switch are just called the appropriate template instantiation. This is kind of a pain to do right now. Um, could probably be done with reflection when that hits. Um, Ah, but you still have to have some code that so you, you have to have some point in the code that goes from a runtime type code to a compile time type code, and that's what this is. We're just dispatching at runtime to make it a compile time type code, and we need a compile time type code because the different type codes tell us what type to pull out of the argument list, and that, of course, is the next thing we're going to do. Um, usable scanf arg, now that it's templated, can pull, a, it can pull something out of the argument list using the va args macro, which you have to pass a type to. And the va args macro not only pulls out the next argument, but also increments something inside of the, uh, of the va list. Um, so that the next time you use it, you'll get the next argument. Um, so this is where it really comes down to you know the real work here. We are going to if we're going to require that each one is either not something we've written to, or it's you know or it points to something usable, and either way we're going to require that it points something writable. So every time there's, say, a percent something d, it's going to come into the int version of this, and it will be saying there's a maybe usable int, but definitely writable int being pointed to by that argument. Do you want a moment to stare at it? Move on. I see some concentrating faces. <laughs> um, I will say this does not work for all of the type codes. Um, in particular, this doesn't cover us for the S type code. S is for string. Um, I'm actually incre you know, increasing the security of scanf a little bit here. I am requiring that if you give a percent %s, it comes with a field width. And the field width tells us how many characters have to be writable. So this is a little bonus that comes with the s. I think the percent %c has the same problem. That's array of cares with maybe without a null. I, I forget what percent %c does. There are an awful lot of uh, 30 or so um, scan of characters to keep track of. Um, okay, I think that has sort of bottomed us out on this deep interface for scan of. Move on. Uh, okay, move back. Oop. Not like that, though. What happened here? 
I lost my video. Oh. Ha! There we go. <laughs> um, there's a key on the keyboard for blacking out the screen. <laughs> um, so, moving back. Here we are back at our interface. It's actually not quite done. There is one more thing that I haven't mentioned, which is STDIN. STDIN is part of the interface to SCANF. Um, and in particular, we need um, STDIN to be a usable input stream for, for single byte char, not necessarily a usable input, input stream for wide char. Uh, that's a whole different function. Um, so there we are, usable input stream for char. And that is actually an interface for SCANF. I think that's pretty much correct. Yes? In, in the real world, it is not modified into the effect by this. Why are we claiming it's usable at the end? Does it matter? It has to be still usable at the end because somebody might scan it again. It can be modified. Usable, in, usable is an assertion about an L value and includes the I, you know, for non const things, typically includes the possibility that it may be modified and, you know. Yes. Yes, I, I would say that a stream that has reached EOF, the best way to model that is, and is it is still a usable stream. It is one that you can ask whether it's at a EOF, for example. Um, it's just you're not going to be successful at reading more from it. And in fact, it is not an error to pass a string that. Uh, uh, you know, it's not out of contract to pass a EOF stream to SCANF. Yes. Yes, the point is it's not really like a badly moved from object, but rather a very nice you know, it's, it's an object that's not very useful, but you can still do some things with it. Um, so there's SCANF. Um, we can try making a better interface for SCANF. If I was making a better interface for SCANF, I'd actually make it a functor that has a set of types. It's definitely going to give you as things returned from the functor so that we can just take our input as parameters and take our output as function results and have happy functions. Um, so here it has a constructor and it has operator parens that returns a tuple. And this is the interface for, um, the, for the constructor. It, in order to call the constructor, you have to give it a format string that matches the type of the functor. Um, I think I forgot to write in that the format string should also be usable because it's part of the input here. But imagine that there. Um, operator parens, this is where you need std in. Um, and you need std in and a usable functor. And you get usable results. Because if I was king of SCANF, then I would say, really, that partial result thing is not helping anybody. If you want partial results, ask for part of the input. Um, you know, returning, in, returning a number that tells you how many things got initialized is just a pain. Um, Question there. Yeah. You don't have a chance to retry because it's an input iterator and you try and you don't get all of it. You're saying that none of it was useful because at least um, you got something. Uh, no, I, I'm saying if you, if you want to see how many things you got, do scanifs that read one thing at a time and see which one fails. That's what I say to do. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, okay, once you have that, 
you can actually make it a little fancier. We'll do F scanf and S scanf all in the same functor. And it's a little painful to make those, so we'll have a make scanf functor that looks at our format string if we pass it as a template parameter and just creates a scanf functor of the right type for that format string. And once we have that, we can actually just declare an, a global, you know, we're making, a, you know, uh, we can just declare a global variable that is scanf with our appropriate format. And that lets us have a fairly nice syntax for using scanf. Here we say scanf my format, parentheses, and that's a const expr object that is our functor and it hands us nice results of the appropriate type according to the scan of string. Um, in C20, you can do this one better because we can just make it a string literal. And the thing that you don't get in C17 is the ability to have a string literal, a user defined string literal have a different type depending on what the string is. But in 20, you can do that. So in C20, you can write your domain specific languages as, as user defined string literals. Um, and really, that's about all I have to say for Scanf. Oh, hat tip to Hana for the inspiration on this example. <laughs> um, any questions before I move on? Uh, no. Okay. Here's one from the POSIX library. Yeah. Lfind. Lots of parameters on this one. Uh, it's more or less a C version of the find algorithm from the standard library. Um, it takes a key, a begin, a size, a begin, a count of elements, a size, I'll just show you. <laughs> Here's the picture. Uh, begin points to an array of things. It's a void star. Um, count points to a variable that holds the number of things. That variable doesn't get modified by lfind even though the pointer is not to const. I don't know what's up with that, but that's how it works. Um, size tells you the size of a single element of the array so that you can increment your void star to the next item. Um, and then we have the compare function and the key. Um, those actually form a functor that what we are interested in is not compare or the key, but rather what happens when we call compare with key as the first, as the first argument. So in a certain sense, I think in a very real sense, I've gotten the green parts wrong here. Those characters are not the job. They kind of look like the job but they're not. These Booleans are the job. The job is determined by the results of the comparison functor as applied to each thing in the array. And in fact, I'll, I'll go one further. Some of these we don't care about. This is the job. <laughs> it's also the scaffolding. Um, in this case, the job is just to walk to the end of the scaffolding and say, here I am at the end of the scaffolding. You might think that's not much of a job. I think that's, as far as I can tell, that's part of what surveyors do. They walk to a particular place and they write down where they are when they're at that place. And that's a big part of surveying. Um, so, here, lfind is a way of surveying this scaffolding. Ah, oh. ready? Uh, so let's write an interface for it. 
And in order to write this interface, I'm going to make a couple of tools that make the casting go somewhere else. <laughs> Here are my tools. End pointer takes voids, uh, it takes a, it takes the begin size and count and figures out where the end of the um, structure is. Next pointer um, advances our void star through the structure. Um, and we can take those back and use them and write a loop over all the scaffolding here. Um, this, just, this loop just walks from one end of the scaffolding to the other end of the scaffolding. And the direct input here is the branches in this loop, which of course are of the form false, 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 and, some t and eventually true. So that's the direct input to, to LFIND. And you'll notice we never actually claimed usability of anything directly here because there is no input that is not part of the scaffolding. The scaffolding we show. And because all the input is just the shape of the scaffolding, we have shown the input here. Uh, the output is actually pretty simple to deal with because we already know what result we expect to get. Well, p, if p is the end, we, are, we expect a null pointer. If, the, if p is not the end, we want to return p. And then we have this annoying thing, substitutable and equal. What is substitutable and equal? It's claiming that the result and the expected result are both equal and substitutable for one another. You might think those would be the same thing, but for pointers, they're not. So substitutable and equal, substitutable and equal. But for pointers, equality does not imply substitutability. You can have two pointers that are equal that you can't use in place of each other because they point to different data structures or they point near to, you know, one is an end pointer when this happens. So here, substitutable or equal does not imply substitutable for pointers. Um, could, could you say that again? I don't understand. Ah, right here. Uh, we have two variables, A and B, that I have declared. Mm -hmm. um, it is possible that if I take the address of A and add one, I get a pointer that is equal to the address of B. You know, that's a legit comparison. I, I can do that and it might come out true. But if I try to access, th if I try to access B through the pointer, uh, through A plus one, that's undefined behavior. Is that because you left the block and you got into that allocated block and so it's not from the same? Effectively, yes. The, it's the, the technical term is pointer provenance. Um, the, these two pointers came from different objects. They have different provenance. Even though they're the same type and same address. That's Even the though they're the same type and they compare equal. Here you go. Um, yes? If you go to the previous slide, because I might have a question about how substitutable and equal is being used. Okay. Well, I think the next slide is very much like the previous slide. Oh. <laughs> so um, uh, here we go. Yeah, in this case, uh, do you also want to claim that compared defines a proper e equality relation, not equivalence relation or something even worse than that? Because otherwise, sorry, do I want to claim, to claim that compare uh, like parameter defines uh, equality relation? Uh, no, I don't. Um, so I don't actually care at all what whether compare actually compares things for equality. Um, I, com I care what it returns. And in fact, LFIND itself um, does not care what compare does on the inside. It just, you know, the documentation for the existing LFIND lets you, you know, you don't even have, uh, the void star doesn't even have to point to the same type. Um, it, it's whatever compare does with that void star is what LFIND uses. So this is 
L find is actually, I said it was like standard find. It's actually a bit more like standard find if, except with this weird extra parameter. Ah, I wrote it to less parameter. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> okay. Uh, any other questions? Well, before I go further, I actually want to talk a little bit about how LFind um, connects to, uh, how this interface to LFind connects to its implementation. Well, maybe that's kind of obvious because the implementation is going to be doing these sorts of operations. The implementation is going to do things that are very much like this loop. Um, so the implementation and the interface here, if we say wanted to look at, the, at element one of that array to do a comparison, um, we're going to go through a whole lot of steps. I think this is, a, you know, I think I've got the list here right. Um, we convert, uh, you know, the caller is going to have some array, they convert it to, um, uh, uh, they convert their array to a pointer, then as they call, it gets converted to a void star. Um, there's a, um, within LFind and with the, within the implementation of LFind or within the interface of LFind, we would be casting that void star to a byte star so that we can add size of t to it and then letting it go back to a void star so that we can pass that to the comparison function, which is probably casting that back to t star. Um, in order to dereference it and do some sort of less than. So I'm making a guess what's happening in the comparison function. It doesn't have to be this. Um, and so the, the, the implementation here is actually doing something very like what's happening in the interface. But the interface has to also do something very like what the caller would do. And the caller probably wouldn't do that. The you know, things that we look at in the caller are going to look simpler because the caller knows what type this thing points to. And it's just going to increment the pointer. But we want those two things to match up. And the first part of this sequence matches up. Operator const t star, they're both looking at an array and turning it into a pointer so, uh, so that they can iterate over it. But then things get a little dicey. Um, on the other hand, we do get some guarantees. For operator plus plus, we have this guarantee in the standard that an object of array type contains a contiguously allocated non-empty set of n sub-objects sub of type t. And at least I read that contiguously um, to mean that incrementing is the same as reinterpret casting to, uh, to byte, reinterpret casting to byte star, adding size of t, and reinterpret casting back. That's what I think contiguously means for an array. Um, you're free to argue with me, but I'm going to make that call here. <laughs> um, so we can actually put that into our picture. Ah, no, uh, that doesn't run afoul of the same problem with provenance that we had because things in the same, or, uh, elements of the same ar array have the same provenance. Yes. Ah, so here there, there's a question of what happens, you know, is there a pre, is this a, is there a precondition on adding to, it's actually a byte star at the point where you add to it. Is there a precondition on adding to the byte star that says you can't go beyond the object that was originally allocated there? And the answer, I believe, is yes. Although uh, there is some question in my mind about what exactly the provenance, you know, how wide the provenance of that byte star is. 
I'm pretty sure, uh, I'm, I'm not going to make a, a hard claim on that this one. This, this one is a hard problem, and there are people more expert than me even at this conference um, on this particular problem. Um, so, um, but in this case, we're trying to stay within things, and in fact, the way we make sure that we're staying within the bounds of the array is by knowing that we have to be repeating things that the caller already did. So here we, we can insert this sheet of substitutability to connect operator plus plus to reinterpret casting, adding size of and reinterpret casting back. And that makes thing looks, things look a little more like what we're doing in the interface. We can also look at the documentation for reinterpret cast, which says exactly what reinterpret cast does as an expression in terms of static casts. So here, expert.reinterpretcast tells us this is a post condition of reinterpret cast. Yes, to make all of this work at scale, we will have to actually go through and write all of these interfaces in full someday. Um, so let's plug that in here. And once we've plugged that in, all the rest fills in by matching. So we can construct these sheets of substitutability between the caller and the interface and have a sheet of substitutability between the interface and the implementation so that we know the things going across the interface match up between the caller and the implementation. They don't always look this neat, though. I chose element one of the array because it actually looks neater than element zero. With element zero, there is no call to operator plus plus. So we must be doing something else. And the, uh, the thing that we are doing is actually found in the documentation for static cast. But the documentation for static cast, which says it inverts standard conversion sequences, is actually telling us a post condition of the standard conversion. So here, uh, documentation for static cast tells us that, the, that this standard conversion can be inverted by a static cast. Um, and again, substitutable and equal. So if we plug that into our picture, it looks maybe a bit more like this, where operator void star has told us what might happen in, has told us about an operation that might happen in the future, should you happen to static cast back, which you often do. So another sheet of substitutability. If you imagine these sheets rolled up into a cylinder of substitutability, that's your inductive proof that everything is going to match up. Um, so I can't actually draw a cylinder of substitutability that will match this up, but that's what's going on if you, you know, if you want to think of this topologically. Um, oh, and I should say for any category theorists in the world, in the room or on the video, uh, this is two category stuff. These sheets are two cells. Um, okay, with that, let's try making a nice interface for LFIND. Here's my choice. Um, we're just going to write a reference implementation, call the reference implementation, and say that the result is the result of the is substitutable substitutable and equal to the expected result. This trick of using a reference implementation is really great for functions whose job it is to walk their scaffolding. Um, it, it doesn't work quite as well if there's more hidden stuff, things that are not shown, you know, things that are only claimed usable in the interface. 
Any questions on Elfind? Okay. Oh, there is one. That's what Elfind returns. The question is, why am I returning a null pointer instead of the end pointer? That's the documentation for Elfind. Um, binary search does the same thing. Um, speaking of binary search, cousin to Elfind is bsearch from the C standard. Um, bsearch has parameters very much like Elfind. Uh, here's our picture. Um, in this case, begin count and size give us the this array that we're um, that we're searching through. Um, the comparison functor in this case is a three-way comparison. It returns something that's positive, zero, or negative, depending on what side of the thing you're looking for you're on. And of course, like Lfind, uh, we don't actually take all of that as input. It would be silly to take all of this, that as input. We're trying to do a binary search here. If we took all of that as input, we wouldn't be doing this in log n time. We would be doing this in order n time. The actual things we look at are much smaller, in this case, just these three. So that is the direct input to bsearch. Again, it's walking scaffolding. Oh, I didn't mention count this time. Not a pointer. Who knows? Um, ah. So let's make an interface. This time, you notice it's a bit lopsided. There's not going to be much in the epilogue. Um, I'm going to take some lessons we learned from Lfind to write this interface in a nicer way. So I'm going to start by just combining compare and key into a functor that does the comparison. And now we, we have one less thing to worry about. Um, we can actually do the same for begin, count, and size. I'm going to combine all of those into a single object, like this. This is a bsearch view. I mean, I could have been fancy and did some hiding and stuff, but I wanted to get it all on the screen. So here, the whole code for bsearch view fits on the screen this way. Um, it actually gives us a tree-like view of that array. It 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 takes a, a, the array and says, there's a middle element. There is a for part that you can have a bsearch view over. And there's an aft part that you can have a bsearch view over. And this other function, empty, that tells you when your bsearch view is empty. Um, and that's going, to, you know, that's going to take care of all of our math, all of our pointer math. I'm agreeing. <laughs> Marshall is agreeing. Um, he, he was looking at it very carefully, and, but he is agreeing. Um, Marshall can tell me whether I got, the, the cal got a decent calculation for the middle element. Uh -huh. That's what I was looking at. <laughs> um, you're talking on that tomorrow? Uh, I'm not uh, talking about B search or research. No, but Midpoints. Mid, no, 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 that'd be September. Talk about oh. midpoint at CPVCon in September. At CPVCon in September. Thank Marshall you will talk about midpoints. Thank you for letting me plug my talk. <laughs> um, and, uh, okay, uh, so this gives us a tree-like view of something that was originally an array. And we can make use of that. We can initialize one right here. Um, there, this is where we actually do the cast to byte star because it fit on the screen better. <laughs> um, and uh, we don't have a lot of room left, so we'll write the reference implementation as a separate function. Um, well, I'll tell you right now, we're going to call a reference implementation like before. <laughs> um, and at the end, we're going to say substitutable and equal result, expected result. 
So here's our reference implementation. Once we have a B-search view, it's actually fairly easy to write our reference implementation. I, I feel pretty happy with the way this came out. Um, and this is just doing a B-search, but also it's showing us what we need in order to do the B-search and telling us what answer we should expect from the B-search. Um, and with that, we can look at that and imagine, well, that looks pretty good already. I mean, we're already templated on the comparison and everything. How about if we just, for our nice B search, use pretty much our, or, you know, we'll just do pretty much the, yeah, do pretty much the same thing just here. <laughs> um, did I get a void star wrong in there? I don't know. Imagine that there is a B search that has a tree view. Maybe in C20, we will um, be even fancier, make tree view a concept, and then we'll be able to do our B, you know, we'll be able to do our binary searches and lower bounds, upper bounds, equal range over things like map and set that are associative containers. They wouldn't have to have their own special versions of those algorithms if they had a, if they had, if we had used a B search view rather, or a, a tree view rather than trying to fit searching into random access range. Yes? Is it true that your B search doesn't require the input to be sorted? Aha! <laughs> Good point. My B search doesn't actually require the input to be sorted. Um, and that's actually fine because nobody's B search actually requires the input to be sorted unless they do some order and check in order to find out and reject the input. There is no B search implementation that actually needs that precondition because that precondition can't possibly be used in a log n pro, in a log n function. Ah, we'll talk more about that later. Um, let's see. Oh, I do want to talk about how we get to elements and how we match things up between the caller the interface, and the implementation. And again, the implementation is actually doing something very much like the reference implementation. It's not very hard to see how those match up. But the caller isn't doing this. It's doing that. The caller is almost certainly setting up this array in a linear fashion, not in a forbiddle and aft fashion. But our interface is doing these four middle and aft calculations to find the, the elements of the array. How do we know that those calculations match up? And the answer is we don't unless somebody does the work of claiming that they do. What we need is a claimable function that says the tree matches the span. And here is the beginnings of the implementation for it. Um, I'm actually going to forward off to a function tree matches subspan to actually do the work. And I'm going to do a little setup beforehand. Because I'm setting up for a recursive function, and I want to make sure that recursive function terminates. And it's going to terminate because this loop here in the comment terminates. This loop in the comment just takes the tree size, halves it, halves it, halves it, and eventually gets to zero. Because any number, any integer you have, if you have it repeatedly, you will eventually reach zero. That's a fundamental property of integral types in C++. Not actually, well, um, 
So let's go into that. Here's the interface for can have until zero. It has the post condition that I promised. Um, fairly simple interface. It's just, this is just a theorem that is getting you over that gap from I have a number to I can have that number until it gets to zero. And you implement a theorem like that, something like this. You're just doing some calculations and making sure each thing um, ha um, works in turn. We do have a loop here. Um, our, our while loop here is going to exit because this earlier one, it is possible to have tilde zero. If you take tilde zero and you keep having it, you will eventually get zero because there's a limited number of bits in, in, in any integ integral type. And this, I think, is actually a fundamental axiom of how math works in a C++ context, that this one loop must, um, you know, must terminate. It is perhaps the fundamental loop that must terminate. <laughs> um, and of course, if it does, then eventually we're going to get out of this loop because we're doing the same test. We're doing another test to get out faster, but we are doing all the tests that are in there. And then whenever we get out, we're going to find out that we have in fact reached zero. Um, I know that was a little fast. Um, I'll point out, you don't have to write all the stuff here on, you know, the, all the stuff on this side of the screen. That's just for the benefit of the humans. The computer can follow, uh, I believe the computer can follow the proof on the left side of the screen. No questions. Let's move, so back to here. Um, now let's take a look at tree matches subspan. I promised you a recursive function. Here's our recursive function. Now I'm doing the easy kind of recursion here um, in that this is an inline recursion. This is handle it happening all within one translation unit where we can analyze it easily, all within one reasoning neighborhood. Um, going through interfaces and implementations for a non-local recursion whole nother ball of wax. Um, but here, what we're doing is just a walk of the tree, saying that the, you know, at each point we say that the four side has to match the appropriate span, the middle has to be equal and substitutable, and the aft side has to match the appropriate span. And this increment, this plus one u here, is the increment, if you follow it over the entire recursion, that's actually incrementing a pointer from the beginning of, of, the, sp of the original span to the end of the original span. So we're doing a tree iteration, you know, a tree walk and a span walk simultaneously to match these things up. We're matching them up in the same order here. So this is what we want to claim in order to make um, the span and the tree, um, you know, the, the, in order to make the span and the tree re in, refer to the same elements, we need to be able to claim this. Um, there is, however, a bit of calculation there, for and aft counts. Uh, here's the interface for how we calculate the for and aft counts. Um, we have, we need to know that the count is less than our bound going in and non-zero. We're not going to do this for empty, for empty um, tree views. Um, and then a few mathematical things that we need to know about the for and aft counts when we come out. And again, I'll show you the implementation of that. We do a bit of calculation to actually get our numbers. And then we have a bunch of calls to theorems and claims in order to explain why our numbers are going to, are, are going to match the um, things we claimed in the epilogue of the theorem. <sighs> 
let you look at that. No, nope, while I have a drink. So here, there are actually three theorems that I need to call from here. All of them are basic math stuff. All of them are things that are guaranteed by the implementation. We don't even write these things into the, into the C++ standard. We just say it does the math thing in these cases. This is um, addition is associative. Um, ordering on integers is transitive. And OK, this one um, is maybe a little more obscure. If you have two things that are in order, the, you know, if a is greater than or equal to b, then if you cut them in half, a, half of a is still going to be ha uh, greater than or equal to half of b. Um, again, I think halving is one of the fundamental operations that um, we want, uh, that is useful to call out at the bottom levels of how math works in C++. Um, Unfortunately, it seems to be more fundamental than counting, and so right shift has that extra parameter that involves counting. So I'll actually show you those theorems. They're fairly straightforward. Here they are. Um, and all these demonstrate a common case for why you have to call a theorem rather than just letting the post conditions match the preconditions all the time. And that's the, this case is each of these is saying something about more numbers than are the parameters to any of the operations. So here, addition is a binary operation, but I want to say something about what happens when you add three numbers. I don't know any way to write that into the post conditions of addition. You have to have some context where you see all three numbers. Same thing for um, less than or equal. I can't say something about three things being less than or equal without having a context where I say, you know, three things being ordered without having a context where I can see all three of them. So call out to a, con uh, to a function to get a context like that. Same thing, ordered halves. In this case, it's a unary function, but I want to talk about two about two values being halved. Um, so, any questions about the theorems? Okay. Um, well, that's sort of the main content of the talk, but um, we can see what sort of lessons we can learn. And I think one pattern we've seen here today that interfaces operate through repetition. The prolog in an interface repeats expressions from the calling neighborhood. Not necessarily from the caller, sometimes from post conditions of things that the caller ca called, but things coming from the calling neighborhood. And it does that repetition so that those things can be again repeated in the implementation of the function. And the same thing happens on the way out in reverse the epilogue can repeat expressions from the implementation neighborhood so that those expressions can repeat, be repeated again in the calling neighborhood. And when you repeat the expressions, you get those sheets of substitutability that connect the values together. And once you think about that lesson, we start to think, if the complexity of an interface matters, there's really no reason that the complexity of an interface should be more than its implementation. If the implementation isn't going to repeat something, it doesn't need to be mentioned in the interface. And, or it doesn't need to be mentioned in the prologue. And, if the implementation doesn't mention something, then you shouldn't need to mention that in the epilogue. The only things that you need to mention in the epilogue are things that the caller hasn't seen yet. So there's no need to ever write an interface where 
it, that is more complicated than the implementation. It's wasteful. And we're not used to thinking of it that way. We're not used to thinking that the complexity of our interfaces matters this way. And it does matter. We want people to run these. We want people to test these interfaces. And it does not help that in the C++ standard library, all of the log n functions that I can find have n squared interfaces. Because they ask for things like transitive ordering, or they ask for, um, they ask for um, random access range. Random access range is n squared, I think. Might be more. But it's at least n squared, because there are so many operations that have to match up to make it a random access range. Um, I will say we do need a, an out for um, being able to write things abstractly. We want to measure complexity by counting the locally atomic operations, that is, the entries into, impl into implementations of other functions. Um, and that lets us talk about complexity in terms of whole operations that we don't break down. And feel pretty confident about this. This is, I didn't think this a year ago. Um, yes. So uh, David suggests uh, that from a user's perspective, um, it is simpler to think about the more complex interface than the tightly written interface. And I think that um, I don't clearly disagree with him on this. Um, if you're writing an interface for a u if you're writing for a user, write in English or some other language. When you're writing in C++, you're writing for execution. So maybe you want in your comments to say, you use this in the case where this complex condition holds. That's the intended use. But what it really needs is expressed by the code. I think that's a, I, I think that's a fair way to split the difference. Yes, John. So I think what you just said is what we would call a note that or a, a hint, a usage uh, suggestion or something like that, which isn't part of the contract. It's merely a hint to a human being so that they don't have to go chase down some person and how do mm -hmm. I use this, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I do have a question, though, that I think that the message that you tell the human being might be a superset of the what's in the code for the very reason that the code could change and the purpose that the human being is targeting is, is, is specifically this. In other words, when you're telling the human being, this is what we're going to do, and the code is how we do it. We might do it in a different mm -hmm. way, but we, and we might do less or more. I mean, it might be incidental that we can handle problems that we're not promising simply because we find a better algorithm that doesn't do everything that it does today, but it does everything that we promised the human being. This is actually a very important mm -hmm. part of engineering and portability. Yes. Uh, John rightly makes a rather complicated comment that I don't think I can repeat, um, but I'll try to pick out some highlights from it. Um, so he points out that, the, that that English documentation that I was referring to when I, uh, answering David's question, um, that English documentation could be considered a usage hint. Usually users um, are going to use it in this way. And so it's useful to know that if you meet these more complex criteria, as you usually will, you will get perhaps more complex criteria out. Um, there's also 
definitely a case for hiding the particular details of how you're going to do things um, so that um, you can make changes in the future. Um, on the other hand, there are different ways. There, there are ways to hide some of your details without changing the, the order. Here, for example, I used, uh, I did in the interface to B-Search, I coded in a particular midpoint algorithm. I could have rounded the other way when taking the midpoint. And maybe we want to build in that flexibility. Maybe in the future, we want to round the other way when we take the midpoint. On the other hand, we, don't we can still write the interface in a log n way because we can just say there is some function that we call in order to take the midpoint. And we're not showing you the implementation of that function. That function just has an interface that says it, it got something near the middle. And that's you know, that for and aft count function that we saw does exactly that. It doesn't tell you how the for and aft counts are calculated. Instead, it just tells you the properties that the for and aft counts have to satisfy leaving open room for changing the underlying tree walk. So I want to say that is exactly what the neighbor's contract does. It doesn't repeat the implementation. What it does is it says, if you call this function, these are the things that must happen regardless of the implementation. So when the implementation changes, these things are still true. Now, there are other things that might happen that are incidental. It could be this way or that way. And that's not specified behavior. It is an essential behavior. Undefined behavior, behavior. And, then and then there's that, that stuff in the middle that, that we, don't we don't care. And mm -hmm. it, 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 you're not going to even talk about that. You depend on that. It's, it's kind of on you, but in reality, it's on us too if you change it. Yes. Um, so, oh my, I don't think I can repeat that very easily. But he does say that um, the English, you know, the comments you write in English, the documentation you write in English or whatever language um, should leave you some slippage, you know, can, can be written to leave you some slippage. And um, perhaps your actual implementation will, of course, be more specified, but because you have slippage, you can change the implementation. Um, what I would prefer in that situation is that if you are planning for slippage, you write your interface in a way that allows it to slip, either through saying that I'm not looking at certain things, or by saying I'm looking at certain things, but there is some function that you don't see the implementation of that says what things I'm looking at. So if you want if you want, for example, the rounding algorithm to be an implementation detail, make the rounding algorithm a function. And the interface can just refer to that function. And the implementation of that function is an implementation detail. And that gets you, in a certain sense, the best of both worlds. You have the ability to change your implementation details in the future while still referring to them from your interface. Let me do one follow-up, because this is actually really important. Suppose I'm writing on a platform that I know today is very powerful. It's a window that does all kinds of fancy, fancy things. It does things that, that uh, you know, are, are really useful to people on Windows, maybe. But that's not the point of what I'm writing right now. I want to write portable code. And I want that my clients to be able to port to this other platform. And it doesn't have those features. So even though this thing has those extra properties that are really good on this platform, I don't want to promise my client that it will be so on the other platform. Mm. And so, so how do I do that in this way, as, as opposed to just saying, ah. the contract doesn't, doesn't promise you that, so if you're counting on that with this limitation, you're stuck to try, try to afford to get the platform. So that is, um, so John's question is a bit more complicated this time. Um, how do you write um, interfaces that can be used, say, on a particular platform where you get very strong post conditions and have, and not promise those post conditions to other, to 
other platforms which don't provide such strong post conditions um, on the same operation. And, and the same application. And, the same application. Um, and what I would say there is something I didn't really plan to get into today, but effectively what you're doing is saying there are two interfaces for this function, a portable interface and a non-portable interface. And the non-portable interface has to nest within the portable interface, which is a particular sort of proof that you do to map, you know, you, you basically um, pretend that uh, the, that the, um, the implementation is surrounded by first the non-portable interface and then the portable interface around that. And non-portable code can call into the non-portable interface, do its thing, get the non-portable strong post condition, and portable code can call into the outer interface that's portable and only get the portable, interf uh, the portable post condition. And the same thing, there are, you know, you want to do the same thing for function pointers, you want to do the same thing for virtual functions. It's actually a fairly old technique for virtual functions, that you have multiple layers of interface. Um, but that is a whole other talk. Um, I will get to one more thing in this talk before my time runs out, I think. There is a bolder statement. I can make here. I feel good about this statement. The next one is very bold. Perhaps the complexity of an interface should be the same as its implementation. That is, maybe we should inflate the complexity of our interfaces so that they show how complex the implementation is. Because if we do that, every interface will show how complex the call you're making is, and we can do complexity analysis on a larger scale than we presently do. That might be a very useful thing to do, I think. No. Ah, a comment? I think this, this kind of points that, 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 that between what you're saying, saying and what John and uh, uh, were saying, uh, uh, I, I, I think these are like completely different, different disciplines. disciplines. The, the, the field that John is coming from, from like the contract perspective, or, or like the high, high like software, software side of software, software, software engineering, and, and you're, you're coming from like the mathematical side. side. And maybe, maybe there's not really a point in trying, trying to like, like make, make them the same. Uh, I, I'm so the 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 point is that maybe John is coming from a very different place than I am, and he kind of is. And the second point was maybe there's no point in trying to make them the same. Um, but I'm going to say that my conversations with John have been extremely fruitful over the years. <laughs> so I think there must be a point in having them. I say get out. Oh, the conversation, yeah, but like, I'm I, skeptical. I, 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 I think um, I want to get to the best of all worlds, and I think that John sometimes pulls me in the right direction, though I don't like his Platonism. <laughs> um, Platonism. Oh, yes, Um Okay, well, with that, are there any remaining questions? And thank you for listening. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I, and maybe it was the examples chosen, I feel in some sense that these, the prologues for these functions mentioning everything they require, they effectively mention the implementation. And maybe that's because I really want to prove the implementation, so if I can say it in the prologue, it gets me at all of my requirements. But maybe thinking more like John, I don't necessarily, I don't, I don't want to be tied to any implementation details. I mean, I guess I want vSearch to be log in, but I could do divide by three, and I don't know if I just want to hide that in a function. Like, I could have a very slow vSearch that walks from the beginning to the end and says, yep, I found it, and by the way, I'm also going to check a bunch of stuff you didn't care about because I'm on a debug version or whatever I'm doing. And so I'm, I'm wondering, essentially, um, is it, why, why do I effectively need to duplicate what's essentially code between this interface specification and the implementation? Isn't there something we could do instead, like actually inspect the implementation mm -hmm. or something? Okay, so the, the question 
um, was very long, but <laughs> um, it amounts to why do you need to write the same things in the interface as in the implementation. And here there were some examples where we wrote quite a lot of the same stuff. You know, the, in particular, LFIND and vSearch. Um, there were full reference implementations there. But that's a specialized sort of function. That's a function where you actually have to do the same work to find out what the input is. That's a, you know, I, I don't, you know, if you look at the scanf um, in interface, or even more so the main interface, those ones had very little um, code in their inter, you know, scanf had a lot of code in its interface. It had to do all the parsing because part of the interface depends on the parsed things out of the format string. But you will notice that all of the conversion of input characters was hidden. That stuff didn't, you know, the interface didn't depend on all of that stuff. The preconditions didn't depend on all of that stuff. Um, and main, a, you know, you could have a huge main, and that was a perfectly good interface for it. It's not telling you a lot about what main promises to do. Um, but particularly when you have, you know, you see a lot of code in the, in the interface, when, the, when you have to do a lot of work to figure out whether or not the call is OK, as with Scanf, um, or when you have, you know, everything that happened in the interface of LFIND had to be done in order to say what the result was going to be. There is no other way to say you got the correct result. Um, so functions that are nailed down so much that there is essentially only one way to implement them are going to see their interfaces essentially repeat their implementations. But functions that have looser interfaces that allow you to change a lot of things, like especially main, where you can write almost anything you want in there, um, those are going to have interfaces that are very brief and don't repeat a lot of the implementation. Um, the other half of the question was, why write these things twice? Um, I do have a solution for not writing things twice, which I have avoided here. But um, if you write an inline function, that I don't think that inline functions generally need to be separated into interface and implementation. No. Sometimes it's a good idea. Not in general, and particularly little inline functions, it becomes really painful to try and do that. Um, and so if you have an inline function that's not going to be changing very much, that you don't need that slippage that interfaces give you, um, you can write that. And I say we should treat that logically as if it's part of the caller. Um, that the, the caller just looks at the code and says, ah, I know what's happening because that code is right there in my translation unit. John has a comment. Twenty years ago, the reason that we put the inline functions at the bottom of the file, we put the inline on a separate line, is so that we can copy it over to the CPP file and back, at will, without changing any other lines of code. And as far as the client is concerned, they don't know. So as soon as you put it into the interface of the class, you're basically promising the client, here is the function. Now, we, I'm going out of my way to make it possible to, full, to have a declaration of a member function and then have a redeclaration of the member function with the contract checking statements on it without a body, and then put the body either in the header file or in the implementation file. And this is mm -hmm. a big deal to me. So I'm just saying it's a big deal to me. It doesn't have to be a big deal to <laughs> me, but it is a big deal to me. Yes. Um, John, uh, John says it is, I think I can paraphrase this, it is a big deal to him to have in, uh, to be able to separate the interface to an inline function from its implementation, um, despite the fact that it is inline. And I think my feeling is 
that it is important to be able to do that. I do agree with John there, which he gives me a thumbs up for. Um, I think that there are situations where doing that is overly cumbersome. And so I think that both possibilities should be allowed. And I want to agree with you in the specific cases, whenever you're writing something in the implementation file and you can change it without affecting anybody else, it would be lunacy to forward declare things and whatever. So when you write static functions in a CPT file, you just write them. It's fine. There's no problem. Let's, let's be real. It's very different when it's going outside your translation unit and you have to maintain it. That's just a completely different ballgame. So I completely agree that there are times when we don't take advantage of this and then there are times that you do. Okay, I, I'm, I will repeat the, only the last line there, but he, John says, yes, there are times when you take advantage of this and there are times you don't. Um, we are over time, are there, uh, let's, let's just finish up, you can ask me questions over coffee. <laughs>